blessed by Almighty God, and I'm so thankful for him that he has allowed me to be here to be a speaker on the 34th Annual Southwest Lectures and to be in the company of your fine ministers and leaders of this great congregation and school. I'm accompanied by my wife, Wilma, and also our current minister, Brother Sean Price, uh, who, is, who is a graduate of, of this school. So I'm just endeared to the school and, and to Brother Wilcott and Brother Brumbach and so many others at this congregation, and also the fine young student uh, that we sent here a few years ago who graduated with honors, Brother Jason Parks. We're glad to see him doing God's work down in the, in the town called Hondo. So we're just blessed to be affiliated with the school and to be in your presence tonight. Now, I am really, uh, what you might say, uh, working out of a hole because Chris put me in it. Chris put me in it. Fine job, excellent job. You can't get a better subject, a, a, a better uh, uh, discourse on the subject that which he delivered just a few moments ago. I'm deeply indebted to him, but at the same time, he allows me to take away a couple of pages of my lesson because he's already been there. So, uh, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm still going to try to do like we old preachers do, and that is give a subject and preach from it. So I hope I don't get too far from it. But we're going to do what we have to do under the subject. Why did God let them die? Why did God let them die? In September of 2014, while attending the 60th anniversary of my high school graduation, in Kansas City, Missouri, I was introduced to a group of attendees, and they, uh, uh, they uh, introduced me as a preacher, a minister from San Antonio, a stranger in, the, in attendance with my classmates here, and I was a preacher, quickly asked me a question, which was, why, the, the, why does God ask us to pray to him for our needs? but refuses to answer our request. I asked, what was your request? He stated, I prayed to God on a daily basis not to let my son die. Please allow him to live. But God let him die. Now tell me, why should I pray to a God who refuses my request knowing the pain and agony we were to suffer if and when he died. There was a momentary flashback for that same question. Why did God let him die was assigned to me a few days prior when contacted to lecture at this lectureship. Sam Wilcott gave me the subject. Why did God let them die? And here I am confronted with that same question. I did not ask for details concerning his son's demise. Those seem insignificant at the moment. There was a question on the floor, and several eyes were fixed upon me to answer. I gently replied, re replied saying, I, am, I was sorry for your loss. However, we must not blame God for your son's or our coming or the coming of our demise. I continue by saying God understands your loss and your agony. God also faced the same dilemma. And then I, was th I started thinking and I w wanted to go into my preaching mode and I wanted to say what Matthew and Luke tells us, that he takes us back to the Garden of Gethsemane and we see a young man, 33 years of age, named Jesus in the prime of his life, but already signed, sealed, and waiting to be delivered as a sacrifice. Jesus, the son, his only begotten son, while agonizing in a sweat of blood, for it was, uh, 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 for if it were possible for his life to be spared, but God refused the request. God's love, God's grace, mercy, and justice was on trial. My wife and I also lost a son in the prime of his life, we believed. A reasonable portion of our comfort was uh, we received was due to the fact that God 
had already set the example by seeing his innocent and only begotten son die on Calvary's cross. If God would have spared his son and then let my son die, then I would have a problem with God. But I serve a benevolent and justice-seeking God who is not a respecter of persons, and I seek comfort from him who understands, who helps me through one of life's most agonizing struggles, the loss or the death of a loved one. I dare not question his judgment. Yes, I do wonder sometimes. Why John, the forerunner, the trailblazer, the harbinger, was beheaded for standing up for the statues of marriage ordained by God. Yes, I could ask why Peter was released from prison, but James was killed. James had a short term in his apostleship. God, why did you let Peter out and let James be killed? Or a few years later when Paul and Silas were rescued. He rescued them. Why didn't he rescue James? But I can reach no satisfaction in questioning an omnipotent, omniscient, and our present sovereign God. I'll get the same answer as did Job. And when even Job was asking him all of these questions, God said, where were you? When I laid the foundations on the earth, tell me if you have understanding. In other words, shut up. Don't question me. I'm a sovereign, almighty, omnipotent God. You you can't question God. All you can do is obey him and take him as he is. So why did God let them die? I will attempt to build my shamanic castle on these few foundational pillars in the time allotted me. Uh, first, I have a few here. Number one, death is universal. Hebrew 9 and 28. There's a time to die, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 20. Why do we die, Romans 5 and 12? And our God is a just God, Psalms 89 and 14. And I will conclude with our God is a God of comfort. Death is universal and we cannot escape it. It's an appointment laid upon us and we must keep it. Hebrew, the ninth chapter in verse 28 in the King James Version. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. All living things die. All human beings become aware of death, the separation from the family, the separation of the spirit from the body very early in our existence. For many, it may seem, it may not seem fair, but it becomes crystal clear. It is an event in which we can do nothing but accept its reality. In Holy Writ, in all about, and in all of our local and national news outlets, there's an obituary column or a page or pages. We read of the hundreds of God's faithful, uh, uh, faithful from Adam to Moses and from Joshua to Jesus, all succumb to the call of death with the exception of two. Enoch and Elisha. Elisha. Enoch before the flood, Genesis 5 and 24, and Elijah after the flood, 2 Kings 2 and 11. From Genesis to Revelation, the just and the unjust, the notorious and the naive, they lived and they died. What separated the birth from the death is what we see in between the birth date and the death date. It's a dash. That punctuation mark is impregnated with the vicissitudes of life. Just as DNA, the biological instructions for the species, the dash is unique for it is the DNA of each individual sojourn here on earth. For some, it is lengthy. For others, it's short. However, longevity or or brevity determines the contents of the importance of their being a part of the framework of heaven. In Genesis chapter 4 and 5, we read the first of many obituary pages in the Holy Writ. The first being that of Abel. We see, you see, we cannot escape uh, death. In 1933, William Somerset uh, Magnum 
told an anecdotal parable of a Babylonian legend. It goes like this. It said there was a servant in Baghdad who was sent to the marketplace by his master. While there, he had an encounter with death. When death made a disturbing gesture unto him, frightened, he rushed back to the master and asked to borrow a horse. He told him about the gesture that death had made him uh, made to him in the marketplace, and he needed to get away to Samara so he could hide. Later, the master decided to go to the marketplace, and he confronted death, demanding an answer for the sudden flight of his servant. Death replied, I was surprised to see him here in Baghdad. You see, I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. You can hide, you can try, but you can't hide from death. You can't hide from God. David tells this in Psalms 139th of the division. He says, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? He says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uppermost parts of the sea, even there thy hands shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about thee. Yes, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. Darkness and light are both alike to thee, for thou hast possessed my range, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise him, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My soul knoweth right well, I cannot hide from God. Secondly, there is a time to die. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. There's a time for everything under the sun to decay and pass away. The preacher writing Ecclesiastes, both men and beasts die, saying, all go into one place. All are dust and return to dust again, Ecclesiastes 3.20. He begins in verse 1 saying, to everything there's a season and a time and every purpose under, this, under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. And he continues through the 15 verses enumerating some, about some 30 common human experiences. We quickly personalize death when a loved one or a close friend passes away. We search for someone or some reason uh, to place blame for our heartache. Even though we are fully aware of the fact, we all must die. Most of us are enrolled in life insurance plans and burial plans, or we have made arrangements through wills or, or other legal documents preparing for the inevitable call of death. We know we must we know we must accept the common denominator highlighted by the preacher in Ecclesiastes verses 19 to 21. And this, this is where it's best regarded as a parentheses, a parentheses explanation in verses 16 through 18, elucidating man's impotence in the presence of the abnormalities of life. For he says this, for that which befalls the sons of man befalls beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dies, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, beast, for all is vanity. He is saying, we all came from dust, and to dust we shall return. In the matter of succumbing to the law of death, man has no superiority over the creatures. The destiny of the immaterial part of man, that is the spirit, is touched in the next verse. And he says this, who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. But before he laid down the pen of inspiration, he wrote these words. Let us hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen. Number three, why do men die? The Bible is very clear. 
We are fully aware that the human family has been placed under a death sentence by the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Heaven and of the human race because of the disobedience of our first parents. Genesis 3.19. The Apostle Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, sufficiently explains the question, writing, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans 5 and 12, Adam's sin instigated by Satan caused all of God's creation to be cursed. Genesis, the third chapter, and starting at verse 17. And then also we can go to Romans, the eighth chapter, at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Everything was easy for Adam before he sinned, but now he had to work. From sunup to sundown. Now he had to deal with thorns and thistles. So the earth rebelled against him. And still he had to work from the sweat of his, sweat of his brow until he also returned to the dust. So it is with all of us. We all die because of sin. Sin separated us, separated us from the fellowship of God. The fact that the disobedient act of Adam and Eve touching or eating of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with a penalty of death imposed by the holiest of holies, it could not be ignored by a just God. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, once he had pronounced that death sentence, it had to be carried out. We cannot begin to understand God's justice until we first understand sin. Sin is lawlessness. First John 3 and 4. It's iniquity. Daniel 9, 4 and 5. All unrighteousness is sin. First John 5 and 17. Therefore the separation from God caused a breakdown where the holiness of God could not communicate with the unholiness of man. The prophet Isaiah made it clear in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins has hid his face from you that he will not hear. Fourthly, our God is a just God. As the psalmist wrote, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Psalms 89 and 14. Justice is a term used for what is right or as it should be. Justice is one of God's attributes and flows out of his holiness. The psalmist also said that there is mercy connected with this justice. Oh, this is beautiful. There's mercy connected with this justice. You see, justice demanded retribution and restitution. But God sent a reconciliation and redemption. Justice demands a payment for a penalty, but the just God provided the payment and the penalty. And that is he gave Jesus Christ. He gave his only begotten son. The Bible says this in Romans, the fifth chapter, starting at verse six. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. But perhaps for a good man, one would even dare to die. But God committed his love toward us while we were yet sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And look at this. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have now have received the atonement. Thank God that he's a God of justice, but he also carries with him mercy, grace, and love. And therefore, we can deal with the inevitable, inevitable coming of death because we know who's on our side. 
And as I hasten to come to a conclusion, not there yet, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to get there. Our God is a God of comfort. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we might be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of God abound in us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. Second Corinthians, first chapter, verses three through five. The pain and sorrow of death of a loved one is a daily occurrence. The daily news brings the traumatic experiences of dozens in our homes every day. Some lose their entire families to crime and accidents and disease and war, natural disasters. There are other misfortunes in the vicissitudes of the human struggle, such as divorce, business failure, employment and unemployment, job relocation and jobs relocated. The one ass testified to the fact that the average family moves once every five years, thus losing close association with their family and friends and classmates. To combat these heart ripping experiences, we need help. God's help in these uncertain times is what we need. David the king, the poet and the prophet says these comforting words, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices and my song will I praise him. Psalms 28 and 7. There are no problems within life's struggles that God has not already addressed. Within the travail of sin was also delivered reconciliation through grace. The apostle Paul recalls these words very succinctly. He says, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You see, we can't out sin God's grace. God is greater. That's why Paul would write in Ephesians 2 and 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. The Holy Spirit has many formulas available to us when we suffer the loss of loved ones. It is a pain in which we shed tears and, and we thank God to be able to shed these tears. The good news is that you can get through any major loss experience and we can get through with this knowing that God is on our side. God can put it to rest. The Apostle Paul confronts us with these words for our consideration as we help God, as we ask God's help through life's struggles. And as I close, why do we continue to pray to God after prayers, after prayers, seemingly that is futile, but we still offer these prayers. Before I came to this location today, I was called upon to do a eulogy of a young lady that I met 45 years ago. She was just out of college, beautiful young lady, full of life, full of hope. She had her college degree and she was progressing to make it work, worth her four years of toil. When she was in a traffic accident working for the state of, of California, she never really healed 43 years later. It was just a painful ordeal to see her seeking to be happy but not being happy. She had braces. She had strokes. She had, all sorts of things happened to her. She was just a great Christian young lady, a great moral, moral Christian young lady. All of her life she served the Lord. A year ago, she was diagnosed with, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Of all the things for someone who had a life that had just been a roller coaster of doctor's appointments and therapy sessions and so forth, but now she has something that is terminal. She passed away, and we eulogized her today. The loss was great to that family. It was great to me because she was such a fine friend but we continue to pray to God. That does not stop our prayers. We continue to pray to God. It's, it's not the, you see, it, you see, death is not the ending 
of our being. Death is a new beginning of a new existence. Revelation 14 and 13, it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, say the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Do follow them. We have to just keep on praying, keep on praying, keep on suffering, keep on praying, and we never lose hope. Why? Because there is something called the resurrection. There is life after death. Jesus said this, marvel not that marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they have, they have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There will be a resurrection. First Corinthians 15 and 9, he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. We are living for the next life. We are preparing for death that we might cross over to the other side. This is what Martha was talking about when she spoke with Jesus. Martha was confronted concerning, com, uh, confronted Jesus concerning her brother Lazarus when the, uh, uh, when she was talking about resurrection, but resurrection himself was talking to her. John, the 11th chapter, then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. She said, yes, Lord, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And as Martha made that confession, the Lord expects us to make the same confession today. Amen. Jesus says, Whosoever therefore that shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. We need to hear the gospel, which is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul would say, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which you receive, and wherein ye stand by, which ye are saved. If you keep in memory that for the preached unto you, left ye bleed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. We've got to hear it, and we've got to believe it. And when we do that, it will cause us to repent of our sins and change our hearts and change our minds, do a turnaround and turn to God. And then we will confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then be willing to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins and have our sins washed away we become a new creature in Christ the blood of Christ removes our sins and now we are born again we wear a new name which is Christian and the Lord is not just going to leave us bouncing around anywhere he's going to put us in a place he will add us to his body the church because we are saved Acts 2 and 47 and now we live faithful unto death death is still coming you obey the gospel, but death is still coming. And he says, be thou faithful unto death. Because after death, there's the resurrection. And now we can meet the Lord one day when the trump sounds and we all can stand before God and we can rejoice because we held out in spite of our suffering and in spite of the vicissitudes of life because we believed that there was somebody looking after us even after death. And many of us who are working, who are now members of the church, a church and trying to work out our soul salvation. We are, we are carrying a lot of scars with us and we're being scarred up every day as we're trying to work for the Lord and do those things that God would have us to do. It seems like the more we try to do right, wrong is always there. And every time we take two steps forward for the Lord, somebody knocks us back two or three steps. But we have to just keep on hanging on. We have to understand that this battle is not over, that this battle is something that we can't quit. It's sort of like a young man, that, a young boy that was, went to the country and had to be with his dad and uh, 
they had a lake outside the, outside the home, and he, he wanted to swim in the lake, and he took off his clothes and ran and jumped in the lake. And he started swimming, but his dad saw him do that, but he also saw in the distance an object in the water that was swimming toward his son. And he started screaming and screaming at his son because he recognized that it was an alligator. The alligator was coming to the son. The son was going toward the alligator. And the father was so passionate and screaming and hollering. The son heard him and the son did a, about a, 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 a turnaround and came back to the shore when he saw the danger. And just as he got to the shore to reach out to get his dad, the alligator got him. The alligator had him by the feet, had him by the legs, but his dad had his arms. And the alligator was pulling and pulling, trying to pull him back into the water, trying to pull him back away from his father. But his father wouldn't let go, held on him so tight and, 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 screaming, and, and, and screaming and trying to hold on to his son that a farmer passing by saw the commotion, saw what was going on, took his rifle out of his truck and came and killed the alligator. Man rescued his son. Three weeks later in the hospital as he was about ready to be released, a reporter heard about the incident and came to the hospital to see this young man. He wanted to see his mangled legs and he pulled up his pants leg to show him the scars on his leg. But the little boy said, no, 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 don't worry about the scars on the leg. Look at the scars on my arms. These are the scars from my dad's fingernails that stuck into my arms as my father wouldn't let go. That's what God is. He's holding on to us. God won't let us go. The devil is trying to pull us back into the world. The devil is trying to take our hope. The devil is trying to erase from us all the great will that God has given us. But the father won't let go. He's still holding on to us. We've got to allow God to hold on to us. Sort of like the hymnologist had the song. You know it. Stand up and let us sing it. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Speech on. Volume. Brightness. Thirty. Volume. Brightness. Volume. Select. Select. Music timer. Music selected. Screen recording.